Всем здравствуйте. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good night. I'm very happy to see more people this year than the previous year because I think the seating was wider and now we're closer together. Welcome to the 8th Eastern Economic Forum. I was planning to start with one thing, but the news that are coming in right now are making me start with a different topic. Probably you've read that the airplane that was traveling from Sochi to Omsk made an emergency landing in the region of Novosibirsk. 159 people were on board and all of them are safe. Only one person um, had an issue with a spike of blood pressure. So let's um, give a round of applause to the pilots. There is another issue, but maybe we'll, we'll speak about it later. It has to do with airplanes. Now, this forum and this plenary session is quite extraordinary. Why? Because 10 years ago to the day, it was announced that the Far East and the Arctic are a priority for us. Yuri Trutnev became the representative of the president to this district 10 years ago, and President Putin addressed the Federal Assembly and said that the Far East is a priority. Now I'd like to give the floor to the president of the Russian Federation and to take stock of what, what we managed to do in these two five-year periods. Good afternoon, dear friends, Your Excellency Pani Yatotu. I'd like to welcome our guest. Please give a round of applause to Her Excellency. Our moderator just spoke, just welcomed the audience and said, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Here, when we come to the Far East, indeed, it's a mixture of the times of the day. Is it the afternoon or is it the morning or is it the evening? But we are not confused about one thing. The Far East for Russia is a priority, a strategic priority for the whole of the 21st century. Let's kick off with that. I would like to welcome the participants and the guests of the 8th Eastern Economic Forum, which per tradition has gathered heads of companies, experts, and representatives of authority from our country and from dozens of other countries of the world to jointly discuss the promising strategic dimensions for the development of the far east of Russia, the Arctic, and the whole of Asia-Pacific region. During today's introductory remarks, naturally, because this is a the, the, the part of our um, economic discussion, I will have to address other regions of the country as well. So we have gathered to take stock of the main trends which define the dynamic dynamics of the international business ties. We know fully well and we see the past changes and the continued changes in the global economy, including due to the fact that some of the countries, first and foremost the Western countries, by their own hand, are demolishing the system of financial, trade, economic ties, which, which they have built to a large extent. It is very important that amid this, there is an expanding space of true business cooperation in the world, cooperation of the countries that do not yield to any kind of external pressure but follow their own national interests. And there are more and more such states in different regions of the world. Such states place at the center of their policy not some short-term matters in politics, but rather the promotion of their own projects in sphere of transportation, energy, industry, finance, and in humanitarian sphere. Such projects that can and do bring direct long-term benefit to the peoples of these countries. In essence, we see the birth of a new model of interaction and relations, but not following the Western patterns, not for the select few, for the select golden billion, but for the whole humanity, for the whole functioning and emerging multipolar world. It is in this model, the constructive energy of openness and being oriented towards a tangible result is becoming a strong competitive advantage of Asia-Pacific region. The key factor 
that defines and I think will do so for the years to come its global leadership in terms of economic growth rate. I'd like to highlight that last year, Russian trade with Asia-Pacific countries increased by 13.7 percent, and during the first six months of this year, it gained yet another 18.3 percent. So 13.7, that was the increase of the past year, and in the first six months of this year, 18.3. We expect that our trade with Asia-Pacific states and our economic relations in general will continue developing because Russia and our Far East are open for stronger trade and cooperation ties, and the potential of such cooperation is hard to overestimate. Far East and Federal District makes up 40 percent of the Russian territory. It is home to almost half of our forests and gold, more than 70 percent of fish stock and diamonds, more than 30 percent of titanium and copper, and so on. Most important strategic enterprises seaports and railroads are located here. In essence, the role of the Far East for our country, for its future, for the Russian standing in a multipolar world is of tremendous significance. We are fully aware of that. That is why I would like to repeat what I have said during the address to the Federal Assembly 10 years ago in December 2013, and I said it at the very beginning, the advanced development of the Far Eastern region is our absolute priority for the whole of the 21st century. It's a common responsibility and a task of the government, regions, major Russian companies, both with both private and with public share. To organize such work over the past years, we've built an impressive legal framework. We've elaborated solid and modern principles of economic and social development of the Far East, as well as the Arctic yet another of our strategic priorities. The moderator have, has asked what are the results, what we've managed to achieve together in this region, what we've managed to achieve over the past 10 years. First and foremost, that has to do with the, with the economic, economic complex. In order to develop industrial complexes and high-tech productions, in order to create new jobs, we've offered to give special tax, administrative, and custom preferences in the Far East. We've taken upon ourselves to build infrastructure, install utility services to the industrial platforms, and such support for businesses is provided at the territories of advanced development and the free port of Vladivostok, though this port has um, some other territories added to it. Since the past year, special preferential regime has been launched on the Kuril Islands. But also, it has um, more beneficial conditions than the advanced territories with longer time frame, and the tax cuts is even higher. I would not go into details not to spend time on that. Thanks to the public support of the Far Eastern projects, investment agreements have been signed, totaling more than 7.7 .7 trillion rubles. Of them, 3.4 trillion have already been invested. 125 jobs have been created, and about 700 new enterprises have started their work. Such milestone projects are being implemented, such as a gas processing plant, one of the largest in the world, as well as a gas chemical facility in the Amur region, Nakotka mineral fertilizer plant, and Zvezda large vessel shipyard here right next door. Deposits of copper and other mineral resources are being explored. Udokanske, Baimske, and Malushskaya deposits. Important projects have been launched in agro-industrial sector. These are greenhouses in Sakhalin region and Primorsky region, fish processing in Kamchatka and
percent, while the Far East enjoyed 39 percent. We can see that also in the production production volumes, the industrial growth rate in the Far East also exceeds average Russian. As the outcome of the past five years, the majority of our eastern regions, Magadansk, Amorsk regions, Zabaykalsky region, Jewish Autonomous region, Primorsky, Chukotsky, and Kamchatsky region are at the top 20 regions of Russia in terms of gross regional product growth. And Magadansky region is at the top of this ranking. I'd give you some figures that speak for themselves. Over the past years, the cargo turnover of the far eastern seaports saw an increase of 1.6 times, new housing 1.3 increase, energy consumption 1.2 increase, annual gold production in the east of the country saw a 1.6 increase, and coal 2.8 increase. Dear colleagues, you have to understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about the percentage of growth, but we're talking manifold growth. I'd like to highlight that the share of identified reserves in the Far East, in general, in, in the region, now stands at 35 percent, only 35 percent of identified reserves. That means that we have every opportunity for a significant growth of producing sector, including scarce and strategic types of raw materials necessary for the economy of the future. All of it does not only guarantee the resource sovereignty of the country, but that is the foundation for producing new materials, microelectronics, and promising sources of energy, for promoting domestic green sustainable technologies and scientific research, for creating high quality new jobs for making use at a new level of the natural competitive advantages of the Far East and all of Russia. In order to increase geological prospecting, we have launched a forward strategy. It's called, it has a beautiful name, Geology, a, a Rebirth of a Legend. I'd like to ask the government to foresee a special chapter dedicated to the expo to prospecting of the reserves of the Far Eastern regions and to prepare the same chapter for Siberia. The future of the Far East as well as the Arctic does not only have to do with the exploration of deposits of natural resources, naturally it's necessary in domestic industry and abroad, but I'd like to reiterate that the strong basis of raw resources for economic development that we are preparing will allow us to move forward and to increase the conversion rate and as specialists say, to have greater added value at the domestic enterprises in the Far East as well. That's the most important thing. For that, it's necessary to improve the conditions for doing business in the macro region and to maintain them at the level of global competitiveness, to ensure a long-term and cheap financing of the investment projects available both for small and medium enterprises as well as for large production companies in all spheres and sectors territories and regions. As you know, we've launched a cluster investment platform at the federal level. This mechanism is intended to finance large-scale projects of systemic significance, first and foremost on producing materials, spare parts, and final goods in manufacturing industry. This year, this investment platform should be used to finance priority projects with a total of no less than two trillion rubles. I would like to ask the government to fine tune this instrument for the needs of the development of the Far Eastern economy so it can, um, so that more complex production could emerge here with modern, well-paid jobs. We need to promote the projects that require major multi-billion investments and they in turn become points of attraction for adjacent sectors, for construction industry, services, service companies, um, equipment producers, and small businesses. I would like to reiterate one more thing, that petrochemistry, gas chemistry, metallurgy, machine building, and other manufacturing um, enterprises are all energy intensive production. We have to say that, that today the majority of the Far Eastern regions that as I have mentioned, are building new housing, opening production and industrial greenfields, 
are still facing the energy deficit. That is an issue, naturally. The scale of the projects that we're implementing in the Far East requires the same scale of updating of the Far Eastern energy system. There are unique conditions here for development of green hydro, nuclear, and renewable energy. I'd like to ask the government, together with our major energy companies and business communities, to prepare the development program of energy capacity in the Far East. It should be aimed at a long-term program till 2050 to expand the economic opportunities of our Far Eastern territories as much as possible. I would also like the government to develop a mechanism for project financing of this strategic program. Moving on, we intend to connect the gas pipeline power of Siberia and Sakhalin Khabarovsk Vladivostok to each other and later to connect them to a unified system of gas supply in the country and to solve, I would not shy away from this world, a historic global task to integrate as a whole gas transportation networks of the west and the east of Russia. Alongside with building Power of Siberia 2 gas pipeline, it would allow us to have flexibility at global energy markets, which is in demand today, as we know, but first and foremost, to significantly expand gasification program of Buratia, Zabaikalska region, and other Far Eastern territories to give the industry here in the Far East additional resources to provide cities and settlements with clean fuel. When providing gas to Kamchatka, we'll use the capacities of LNG terminal that one of our companies has already created. This dimension is developing um, very actively, including the Arctic. After a successful launch of Yamal LNG project, we've launched a new large-scale project of LNG in the polar region. By that, I mean the first production train of Arctic LNG-2. It is already situated in the production area and is undergoing initial commissioning. Yes, that's what is happening. It's great. I'd like to say that this train, in essence, is a floating facility for liquefying natural gas. It is unique in the world and is based on Russian technology and capacity. It is being produced by Murmansk Center of Large Sea Facilities Construction. By 2030, the production of LNG in the Arctic zone of Russia must increase threefold up to 64 million tons per year. With that, we've made a principal decision to produce at this Murmansk center of new LNG trains for their work in the Arctic fields. At that, naturally, we have a positive impact in the development of our northern regions and in strengthening the technological sovereignty of Russia. A powerful center for LNG production is planned to be created in the Murmansk region itself. I, I want to mention that, though it has nothing directly to do with the Far East, but however, in order to provide gas there, we'll be building a pipeline, Volkov, Murmansk, Bela, Kamenka. I really hope that our companies would uh, agree on the mediation with the mediation by the government who and how will build this very important infrastructural project. It's very important for the city of Murmansk and the settlements of Murmansk region and Karelia. To support the business initiative and in general the economy of the Arctic and the Far East and its citizens, it's important to have transportation projects. We need to expand the current logistic routes and open new cargo corridors. And a special place among these projects is held by the development of the Northern Sea Route. Last year, it was used for transporting 34 million tons of cargo. In the nearest years, the cargo flow of this global transportation corridor would only increase. That requires an advanced construction of modern icebreaker fleet, modernizing Arctic ports and their infrastructure. By 2030, of the seaports of the Arctic Basin. Last year, it stood at 123 million tons, while by the end of the decade, it should total at the level of 252 million tons. Through building new terminals, expanding railroad connections, by 2027, we plan to significantly increase the capacity of the Murmansk port from current 56 up to 110 million tons per year.
we can will continue to modernize Baikal Amur main line and Trans-Siberian Railroad, and we need to work more actively there to also including the using the mechanisms of concessions raising private capital for building bridges, tunnels, and overpasses. We've just discussed these issues with the moderators of the sessions. And here I'd like to highlight that it is upon private initiative that the Pacific Railroad is being constructed and a new port on the shores of the Sea of Okhotsk is being built that would allow to connect the resources of Yakutia and the north of Khabarovsky region and to provide a direct access to the Asia-Pacific markets. Our major companies are building new seaport in the Taimir Peninsula modernizing railroad Pangodi Nadim in the Yamal. There are plenty of such examples when the business is playing a long game, is investing in logistic transportation energy projects, in building railroads, highways, seaports, terminals and airports. I'd like to ask the government and colleagues in the regions to actively use the resource so that both public and private investment will give a synergy for updating infrastructure, social sphere, spatial development of the region and the country on the whole. I've already appealed to our entrepreneurs, many of whom have come across certain pressure from some partners. I would like to repeat yet again. There is, it is more reliable and it's better to invest capital in Russia, both in major, large-scale, ambitious infrastructural projects, both locally. They're also important for urban development and tourism. And we see what is happening with the capital, the way they're moving. Do not fall in the same pit twice. Just recently, we have opened a new stretch of a high-speed motorway from Moscow to Arzamas. By the end of this year, the motorway will have been extended to Kazan and further on to Yekaterinburg and Tumen. I would like to announce today that we are certainly going to continue with this large-scale project. The high-speed motorways are going to go through Siberia and the Russian Far East, reaching the Pacific coast, thereby creating a single transport corridor stretching from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok and named Russia. It will it so, serve as a basis for developing tourism and linking logistics, agrarian and manufacturing hubs, incentivizing entrepreneurship and the renovation of cities and rural settlements. A particular subject I would like to broach today is the development of air flights to the Russian Far East from the European part of Russia and also improving the direct connectivity within the Far East so that if you want to go to your neighbors, you don't have to go via Moscow or via Siberian airports. For these ends, we have set up the single Far Eastern airline. The most important connections are subsidized by the government, which makes the tickets more affordable and creates additional opportunities to explore new connections, new routes, including local ones. I suggest we should support this crucial work and put it on a systemic basis. I would like to ask the government before March the 1st next year to draft a comprehensive plan of action to develop flight connections within the Far Eastern Federal District. And it should include the construction of new ones and the upgrade of existing airports, improving the standards of light aircraft, supplies of Russian-built aircraft and helicopters, and of course, making more affordable the um, air tickets in particular through bringing down the costs of companies on aircraft leases. Of course, concrete parameters and goals are yet to be determined, but I think it would be the right thing to do to say that by 2030 we should make sure that the number of passengers on the flights within the Russian Far East hits at least 4 million per year. Distinguished colleagues, the most important integral goal of all of our plans we pursue in economics and transport or infrastructure in the Russian Far East is to improve the lives of our citizens, to create comfortable modern environment for studies, for work, for recreation and for bringing up children and to make sure that there is a steady increase in the population 
and the Russian Far East. To these ends, we've launched a number of mechanisms, including the Far Eastern Hector. More than 119,000 people have got a land plot to do business, open up a production or a tourist facility, or build a house of their own. And I will remind you of the tasks we have set by this autumn we need to draft a legal framework for the construction of individual housing across the country the thing is this program should include escrow accounts similar to what's being done with apartment buildings to add an additional layer of protection for the money of our citizens and attract additional funds and make it easier to secure a mortgage to build a house of your own. I would like to draw the attention of the government to the following fact. These mechanisms need to start working before the end of this year across all of the country, including the Russian Far East. I would like to point out that in the Far East, special terms are provided for mortgage. It's up to 6 million people for a maximum of 20 years at no more than 2%. Using this instrument, almost 78,000 families have already acquired or built a new house. I suggest we should adjust the rules. We need to raise the ceiling, and this is something we discussed yesterday, to 9 million people. For those who would like to buy a house of their own of more than 60 square meters, Thus, families will have more opportunities to buy a flat in a new housing project or to build a house of their own. I would like to add that originally the Far Eastern mortgage was oriented only towards young families. But starting from last year, all teachers and all doctors working in the Russian Far East can get such a mortgage. They're entitled to do that. So I suggest we should make the next step and increase the scope. We must make sure that the mortgage at 2% should be available to those who work in the defense industry in the Far East. All those who work in the defense industry and the Far East, regardless of their age or family status, just as we did for the doctors and for the teachers. Moving on, we have proposed specific mechanisms to develop housing in the Russian Far East, including the Far East Quarter program. Companies uh, building neighborhoods get the same preferences as those who work in advanced special economic zones. As a result, when design is carried out, apart from the building itself, you also create an urban environment, social infrastructure, kindergartens, uh, clinics, and sport facilities. Uh, there is a new satellite town constructed under this mechanism, and it's going to be home to more than 80,000 people. I would also like to say that in order to encourage comprehensive development of social infrastructure in the Russian Far East, a special presidential subsidy has been introduced under this program. Uh, 1,500 facilities have been constructed, upgraded, or equipped in all the Russian Far Eastern regions. These include schools, hospitals, sports facilities, fitness and recreation centers, cultural centers, and so on and so forth. Just a couple of facilities that have just been commissioned, the cardiovascular center in Yakutsk, the nuclear medicine sector uh, center in ulan Ude, the games, sports, and combat sports center in Komsomolsk on Amur and also housing for social workers in Chukotka, the lighthouse park on the Sea of Okhotsk in Magadan. There is another large avenue we are pursuing, namely the upgrade of 25 agglomerations and cities in the Russian Far East. I'm not going to name all of them, but yesterday we had a public discussion about that, and these cities will get an upgrade based on new master plans, taking into account the advantages and uh, weaknesses of each and every country, uh, of each of every city, sorry, and uh, based uh, also on the urgent and longer term social, environmental and logistical goals and the um, prediction for the dynamics in the labor market, demand for housing and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, this uh, is a clear long-term vision, 
as well as a step-by-step -step program to develop the Far Eastern cities, and we discussed that. And uh, we need to think about using that and extending that funding until 2030. We need to pay special attention to municipalities, even small ones. There's the program, 1,000 courtyards. Under this program, last year, 1,245 public spaces have undergone enhancement. Another 500 are going to go through the similar program this year. And I would like to emphasize that we have decided that there needs to be a special Far Eastern section at all of our developmental programs. Thanks to that, we have acquired a very good pace of uh, government investment in the projects in the Far East and this level, this dynamics, these Far Eastern priorities in our government investments need to be preserved. Moreover, the Far East should not just be an accelerated economic social uh, development territory or accelerated social and urban development. These plans and projects, uh, notwithstanding, we should never lose sight of the need to care for the unique ecosystems and uh, preserving hundreds of rare species of flora and fauna. This year, we have held the International Falkentain Forum, which is dedicated to uh, preserving predatory and rare species of birds. I would like to thank our colleagues from the uh, Near East because they pay a great deal of attention to this topic. Distinguished colleagues, we are going to continue working with you on this uh, humanitarian subject, which is very interesting. The Far East has uh, more than 60 specially protected natural territories, and some of them are part of the world, natural heritage such as Lake Baikal, the Lena Pillars, uh, the Wrangel Island natural reserve, Kamchatka volcanoes, and so on and so forth. This is all uh, our national treasure, but also this is the treasure for the whole planet, and we must protect it. At the same time, we have to provide opportunities for scientific research, for recreation, for leisure and education of children and young people, and also to make sure that Russian tourists and foreign guests can, uh, can get acquainted with the wonderful nature of the Russian Far East. And as we said, the Russian Far East needs to become a platform for new economy, tourism uh, in natural parks in pre Moski Krai, Kabaras Krai, Yakutia, Buryatia, Kamchatka, the Kuril Islands, and other regions, including. Starting from uh, September 1st, we saw the entry into force of a law that creates a legal environment and decent conditions for ecotourism. It also lays the groundwork for tapping the potential, the scientific and tourist potential of uh, specially protected natural territories, uh, which need to be provided with the requisite infrastructure. With uh, uh, that said, this year we need to provide additional resources for the natural parks in the Russian Far East. And this should not be done through reallocation of other funds. We have to add more money reallocate additional funds for these purposes. A couple of words about the new industries in the Russian Far East. At the end of my, the May, there was an exhibition, the development of creative economy in Russia. And back then, there was a substantive discussion. And we heard interesting proposals from young people and entrepreneurs, including from the Russian Far Eastern regions in Yakutia, in particular, thanks to the regional authorities and thanks to the initiative of the business people themselves. We saw the uh, creation of one of the best creative industries in coding, architectural and industrial designs, cuisine, and so on and so forth. And this experience is going to lay the groundwork for the regional standard for the development of creative industries. And it's important to make sure that Russian brands are more recognizable. I've just met the moderators of the sessions. I've spoken about it already. And the moderators have informed me to my joy that this uh, process is uh, going forth at a very good pace, and we uh, believe we can support the demand for Russian products, for Russian services through exhibitions and festivals. The first fair of creative industries took place in August in Novosibirsk, attended by 70 Russian producers. 17,000 people visited it within the three days. The second fair 
has been hosted by Vladivostok in the recent days, and this event has been part of the cultural program, this forum. And I believe that the other regions of our country are going to take up the relay and continue with that initiative. And another issue with the Russian Far East there has been a new decision on the new industries and economics and culture and sport. We have agreed that the Federal Eastern Federal Federal Eastern Federal District is going to host a yearly cyber sport tournament. This cyber sport is hugely popular in the world and our cyber athletes are among the leaders in the industry and I'm confident that such high level events in Russia will help promote computer sport and the first tournament is going to take place at the end of this year, I would like to ask the Russian IT companies and companies with a government share to pay greater attention to this type of sport and support it. Distinguished colleagues of the last decade, we have done a lot for the Russian Far East and for the Arctic, creating a significant impetus for the development in economy, in the social field, in infrastructure. We have created unique conditions for doing business. These conditions are unique. I'll go as far as to say that we have ruled out large-scale milestone projects in mining, manufacturing, housing development, as well as upgrading the transportation network. We have uh, drafted and began to implement plans to improve our cities and rural settlements. And this is these accomplishments are largely and primarily due to the people who live in the Russian Far East whose uh, families have lived here for generations than those who are newly arrived from other regions of Russia to uh, study, work, do their own business, to uh, all of those who believe in the future of the Far East, who believe in the enormous opportunities and potential, and who make their contribution to the development of the Russian Far East. My special thanks go to you. And let me reiterate, the Russian Far East is our strategic priority for the whole of the 21st century. I end my remarks with what I started with, and I'm confident that the role of the Russian Far East, just as the role of Russia across the world, is only going to grow. Thank you for your attention. Uh, well, a friendly shake of hands. Um, Madam Vice President, uh, I will give uh, the floor to you a little later, if you don't mind. First, I would like to ask several questions and address these questions to uh, the president. And these questions are related to what we've just heard. Well, it's interesting to hear what you have just said about the uh, priority attached to the Russian Far East, because it might seem that the priority currently is in the West and we are sparing no effort. Well, there are many priorities and the Russian Far East is one of the main priorities. So this is the third time you say that, so we will keep that in mind. You have mentioned M12 motorways, so a huge thank you. And also my thanks go to Marat Chakirzanovich. I am uh, from a small town, you know, between Moscow and Vladimir, sometimes it takes six, seven hours to get there by car. It was impossible. We'll try the new motorway and see for ourselves how it is. So straight away, onto the questions. You know, I've jotted down some things. You said the historic global task. Those words were dedicated to the Russian Far East. So, you know, I draw a comparison. We can uh, compare these priorities with what Stalipin was doing in order to explore and develop Siberia or, you know, the industrialization plans and the USSR. So had it not been for sanctions first in 2014 and then in 2022, had it not been for the sh closure of the borders, had it uh, not become impossible to place our capital in the West. So what do you think would have happened? Would these global plans have realized, would it have been possible to implement all of them, you know? And to support my words, I'll cite some statistics on the special, special uh, economic zone. Uh, so right now there are 60 residents uh, plus 43 residents over the last year. So it's a surge, an explosive growth. You know, we started to do this work a decade ago. You asked me that yourself. And I said that. So we began working here long before all the 
developments that have been transpiring starting from 2014. And we started this work because we saw certain trends in the development of the world economy. We saw the emergence of new centers of influence, new centers of economic development. Well, I don't need to name those countries for you. Everyone is aware what I'm, of what I'm talking about. So we understand there is a pivot happening. And these trends are enduring. Moreover, they are becoming even more pronounced. But what happened after 2014, after the Western countries supported a coup d'etat in Ukraine, after they started a war in Donbass, Many processes have got a spur becoming accelerated. So the only thing we can lament is that we didn't implement timely all the plans on infrastructure development, which we used to have in the Russian Far East. The government made a small miscalculation. We didn't expect such a great volume of uh, cargo flow because of the recent years. It's become even bigger than anticipated. But we are still doing all right. The plans are there. The plans were drafted before, and it's going to be easy to implement them. You know, we've just spoken to the moderators. We have spoken about the plans for the development of the Eastern Polygon. We have the necessary funds. The investors are willing because there is a market ready for them, and they are willing to invest their own money because they see a return on their investment thanks to this large flow of uh, cargo freight. So the, uh, the return on investment is quite high. Yes, we started this quite some time ago, but what's happening in the world economy over the recent years has become an additional incentive for us to look to the East. But you said that we should not fall in the same trap twice. So are there those who still have not understood? Well, if you're interested, I think many in the business community are interested in that, you know, there is a trend. Many business people in the past used to build platforms for themselves, and then they run into problems when their assets legally earned were confiscated or seized. You know, the money, the assets of our companies, this goes beyond the pale. Those who are doing that, who've done that, barely realize the negative consequences for themselves. You know, the restrictions on settlements in dollars, what's the consequences uh, of uh, the consequence of that? It only makes country, other countries think about their own currencies or uh, creating alternative payment systems. Many are rethinking if they need to store their money in the West, in the US, uh, if they need to invest in the securities. I can assure you this is happening. Anyone would start thinking about that. Oh, just remember the uh, freeze of our gold and uh, foreign currency reserves. You know, we, we've got back even more money than that. It's not about those 300 billion. They are simply undermining the trust in their own system. And the same goes for the restrictions on trade that they've introduced. So only God knows. They're the ones to blame for these negative consequences. And these negative consequences will realize are already happening. But this is not what we sought. This is an objective process, which is due to the emergence of new centers of economic growth developing so rapidly. Yes, and I'm going to talk about the traps you shouldn't fall into. So be that as it may. We see that as of now, supply chains have almost completely recovered. The situation has mostly normalized. And the same goes uh, for the 
currency exchange rate of our national currency. This is thanks to uh, the uh, currency earnings getting back. We understand why all of this is happening. We need to agree, come to an agreement with the businesses and convince them that it's uh, more reliable to work here. So you shouldn't fall into the same trap twice. I'm sure that those whom I am addressing understand what I'm referring to. So my next question is about the relationship between the government and the business that is getting back, in particular, those businesses that arrive on Bruski Island. Before the uh, forum, I had an interview with uh, Mr. Belousov. I asked him about the relationship between the government and the business. He uh, said that the government is the senior partner and the business is the inferior partner. Did he say that? Well, he used to work for Gosplan, you know, for the state economic planning agency. That's why he said that we have to be partners on an equal footing. Well, I'll ask his opinion after these words of yours. Well, he knows this is just a, jo a joke. So that said, you said partners on an equal footing. But don't you think that there is too much of the government presence in the economy? Well, we've heard that said, and we've heard people talk about that, but that's not truly the case. Yes, we do have big companies, especially in the energy sector. But the private companies are developing at a rapid pace and they enjoy our support, in particular here in the Russian Far East. And as you can see, all of our investment in the Russian Far East are accompanied by infrastructure investment coming from the government. I think over the last three years or so, we have invested I don't remember the uh, precise figure. I think uh, 15 billion or so to support the business. And this year, 8.5 billion. And in the next three years, another 33 billion is going to be invested. So we are also providing preferences uh, to our companies, especially here in the Russian Far East. Let's stay here in the Far East as we're here. I also mentioned the advanced special economic zones. Just think how many preferences they enjoy in terms of social contributions, the profit tax, the property tax, and as far as the Kuril Islands are concerned, the preferences there are even bigger than in the advanced special economic zones here. So this relationship, this cooperation between the government and the business is already yielding some very good tangible results. Furthermore, there's another important thing, in my view. Between the government and between the business circles for decades, maybe two decades, we've managed to foster a very good dialogue. The government barely makes any economic decisions without prior consultations with the business associations. We're always trying to take into account the view of our business partners and also the trade unions. You've spoken about the advanced special economic zones, the special economic zones, tax preferences. I've spoken to experts in this field. They are saying that this is not enough. What is required is an infrastructure, you know, like gas, utilities. This is lacking. Yes, that's why I said that. You know, 25 billion, that's how much we spend on the infrastructure. I remembered, so uh, 8.5 within the first six months this year and another 33 billion in the next three years. We are doing that. We understand we need to do that. We need that uh, because we need to support the infrastructure. This is how our support uh, is going to be realized. And we, we spoke uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, the uh, currency exchange was uh, 50, 60 for a dollar for a euro. Right now it's 83 rubles for a dollar, so the volatility rate is very high. And uh, in 2022, the Russian currency was the most volatile in the world. So amid these conditions, how is it possible to make any predictions when you do not understand what's going to happen to the national currency? Well, truly, it's a question that requires a careful study. 
you know, by the central bank, by the government of Russia, by the financial authorities, but in general, I do not think that there is an insurmountable problem there. The difficulties can be overcome. What's happening is uh, related to a number of factors, in particular uh, with the return or non-return, partial non-return of uh, the currency profits of our biggest exporters. The thing is, at the first stage, you, you mentioned when uh, one dollar cost uh, 60 rubles, the supply chains for import had not yet been set up. Right now, the import is growing into the Russian market, which means that there is a bigger demand for foreign currency. There are other factors in play, but these factors can be, can be managed. We see them. We understand them. The central bank uh, sees them as well. It had to raise the interest rate to 12.5 percent. The thing is, the inflation started to pick up a little bit. Right now, it's 5.2 percent or so. I don't remember exactly. Yes, 5.2 annualized. So the central bank had to respond. It couldn't help responding. And I think uh, the uh, measures taken were timely. Yes, it tightens the space for lending and uh, limits a little bit the uh, economic expansion. But it is a significant factor that brings down the inflationary risks. Everything needs to be done, uh, done timely. So this is a manageable situation. I'm not going to go into detail because this is a very delicate, sophisticated subject, but it can be managed. So that said, the government intends to regulate or introduce certain limitations, you know, because when the uh, ruble weakened last time, the advisor to the president, Maxim Areshkin, had to write a special column, uh, an article, then the uh, ruble appreciated a little bit. You know, there are loopholes, as you say, when money is being funneled. Well, the thing is, they're trying to scare. Let's do that peacefully. Otherwise, we'll have to introduce uh, restrictions, you know, oblig obligatory return of uh, forex profits, but no one is going to do anything drastic about the central bank and the key rate, 12 percent. This week, uh, this Friday, there's going to be another meeting of the Board of uh, uh, Governors, and there is a chance that the key rate can be brought up even further, and the lending is going to be costlier. So how will you be able to develop the industry? Because the money is going to be more expensive. The credits are going to be more expensive. As I said, the key interest rate does have a bearing upon the cost of money, upon the lending from the commercial banks. It is, puts constraints on uh, borrowing in the economy, and it constrains economic growth. But that, nonetheless, we see that the lending rate is at a rather a high level. Secondly, we see an accelerated rate in uh, you know, uh, consumer lending. There is an array of instruments to counter those risks. I'm not going to go into detail. Talk to Governor Nabiulina. She'll tell you everything. So we have to exert some influence on these processes. But But should we lose the moment and there's going to be an unconstrained inflation spike, it's going to be even worse for the economy because if the inflation is uh, roaring high, then it's almost impossible to build the economy. There are no good and even better solutions. There are difficult decisions and more difficult decisions than they need to be made in a timely manner. And this is what the government up until now has been doing quite efficiently to boot. And another question about the mortgage. I'm terribly sorry, but I need to add that we need to understand, yes, the price of uh, credits is growing, but we have a whole range of instruments for the most important industries for the most important projects of great importance to the national economy. We also need an array of support measures to get credits. Some uh, credits are accompanied by preferences, by concessions. 
there is a whole range of mechanisms and tools to assist companies involved in large-scale investment. And it's done together with the government. Once again, I'm not going to enumerate all of them, like, you know, industrial platforms. The business community is well aware, and this is going to continue. But there's another issue. Should the credit become costlier, then the government will have to give some thought to providing more funds for these instruments. It will involve additional expenditure, and this will be tied to the resilience of our state budget and to its balance, but we can work with that. You said about expanding the concessionary mortgage lending here in the Russian Far East. The central bank has uh, said several times that, you know, there's a bubble of uh, mortgage in Russia. So do you see any risks? Yes, we see the risks and we are countering them. The thing is, there are 12.5 million people living behind the Ural Mountains in the east of the country, so that's not too big of a burden for the economy. And the last question before I give the floor to Madam Vice President, the question of great importance to the business, are you going to raise the taxes or not? Is there a need for that? Right now, the government does not see a need for that. That is very important for the business community right now. I would like to give the floor to you, Madam Vice President. but. Before that, just a couple of interesting facts about Laopedia for the audience. I think that is important. First, the diplomatic relations between the USSR and Laopedia were established in 1960 on October the 7th. So that's yet another, you know, uh, opportunity to celebrate. Yes, we'll celebrate together. Starting from 2011, there is a strategic partnership between Russia and Lao PDR in the Asia Pacific. Another fact, Lao PDR is the country that suffered the biggest bombardment in the world. More than 200,000 bombs were dropped on Lao PDR. 350 Lao PDR, 1,000 Lao PDR citizens died in those uh, bombardments during the Vietnam War. Moreover, Lao PGI is still uh, devoted to the ideals of socialism. Then there's the pioneer movement in Lao PGI. I didn't know about that, but when I got ready for the session, I learned about that. Fifth, uh, Lao PGI citizens still love baguettes, you know, and uh, white bread. It's like a legacy from the French. And Lao coffee is considered to be one of the best in the world if I read that correctly. And another thing that is important to Russia, for 30 days, you can spend your time in Lauer PTR without a visa for Russian citizens. So uh, welcome to Lauer and welcome to Vladivostok, Madam Vice President. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted and privileged to have the opportunity to participate in this 8th Eastern Economic Forum this time. Lao PDR is one of the ASEAN member states and is one of the country that has uh, only a, a population of only 7 million. And it is a land that is rich in natural resources, hydro, energy, minerals, and also forests. And we also have many tourist sites in Lao PDR. And regarding the Russian uh, ring for Lao, Russia dialogue relations, even before. Uh, with the USSR, we have maintained traditional, solid, and good relations, which was later elevated to the Strategic Comprehensive Partnership Security in Asia Pacific. And then the two sides also cooperated in many areas, 
in economic, tourist, human capital development, and the two sides also uh, exchange information and lessons learned in many other areas of mutual interest. Corporations between Lao PDR and Russia have also contributed to mutual support and mutual assistance. And we have cooperated on the basis of mutual benefit. And at the same time, Lao PDR is still a developing nation. And therefore, the Lao government attaches great importance to socioeconomic development by attracting uh, investment from many countries around the world, including from Russia. And the two sides also uh, invested in uh, areas of importance like energy and hydropower. And of course, uh, we also receive humanitarian assistance from Russia in demining. And this is an assistance that has no conditions. And we are still experiencing uh, negative impacts from the unexploded uh, clearance. And this unexploded ordinance has uh, negatively impacted the life of our people, especially the way of life of our people. And with the help and assistance from Russia, we have been able to clear more than uh, 20,000 hectares of lands. And after the clearance, we return that, that 20,000 hectares of la lands to the people of our country. And UXO, especially unexploded ordinance, is something that uh, we attach great importance, uh, especially in addressing the risk from uh, the unexploded ordinance. Kopta in Lao means thank you. Yeah, so I'm right. Vladimir Vladimirovich, question to you. And later I'll ask you a question. Back in the 90s, we stopped to be a friend or supporter of many other countries. For example, Cuba, Lao. Um, is it difficult for us to restore these relations presently? And is it possible to elevate them to the same level we had back in the USSR? In, in the 90s, we uh, got our freedom, and we lost a lot without re realizing it. We just spent what we've accumulated for the previous dozens and dozens of uh, years uh, during the Soviet Union era, but uh, the historical memory uh, in uh, that countries, uh, which uh, used to be friends of us, and uh, we helped a lot uh, to this country. So this uh, historic memory is still there. And basing ourselves on new principles is not that difficult for us to restore uh, these relations, because uh, p people over there want this. Uh, I'm talking about Lao, I'm talking about Asian Pacific uh, area in general. It has to do with Africa. For example, recently we had a Russia Africa summit, and I was surprised with the openness of uh, African people with their, with their willingness, willingness to work with us. And actually, I kept thinking it's not because we helped. Africa to get their independence and freedom to fight colonialism, although it was very important, and they do remember this, but they still remember other things. Well, I believe that uh, the main, the most important thing was that we have never been a colonial power, nowhere. Our cooperation was based on equal, on equality or our desire to support and uh, help, and countries who are now, who are trying now to compete with us, they used to follow another policy, another politics whatsoever. And when people 
can compare what happened in the past when it came, when it came to Russia or former USSR and other countries. Well, uh, it's all in favor of Russia, and we have to take this into account. Well, let's take Africa as an example. Talking about cooperation, we helped them and the colonial powers back in 1957. I, I saw photos of that time. Uh, so, to European countries, to Belgium, brought people from Africa in in chains. Well, uh, kids uh, were exposed in uh, as uh, African villages in behind behind bars, and. Uh, they brought people from Africa and they exposed them, the entire families and people and the kids behind bars. How one can forget this? Nobody, nobody in Africa will forget this. And uh, they're still trying to uh, impose their neo-colonial uh, policy there. That now the African debt is three trillions of dollars. So they created such a financial credit and financial system which resulted in huge debt. They cannot pay, for, African countries cannot pay for their credits. By definition, they are not capable of doing this. It's not credit type relations, it's like a contribution. And we follow completely different approaches. We did this in the past, and we keep doing this now. And this is our uh, competitive edge when it comes to our cooperation with our partners and with those whom we had uh, specific relations back in the Soviet Union and with those with whom we are developing our relations presently. Those are our friends as well. That's why here I cannot see any particular difficulties especially when it comes to restoring our, our former positions. Well, talking about this, another question. What shall we do with other countries which do not regard uh, uh, Russia as uh, like that, like Baltic states, uh, Czechs, Czech Republic and Hungary, they still remind us of our troops uh, which entered uh, to those uh, cities like Budapest. We recognize this. We recognize this as a mistake uh, uh, by the Soviet Union, and it actually undermined our relations. One cannot, when it comes to foreign policy, one cannot do anything which undermines interests of other countries and other peoples. But we shall not step this uh, this, uh, we shall not uh, repeat the same uh, error twice. Uh, and here I'm talking about U.S. They are pressing their uh, allies, the so-called partners. They don't have friends. They have only interests. This is a British formula. And now a, a question to you, uh, Your Excellency. I see. So please tell us, what are the benefits that Laos can get from cooperation from Russia, and why have you taken a decision to start again learning Russian language in Laos? I'm sure it's not just because the president of Laos can speak Russian. Um. As uh, mentioned by uh, the president, of uh, Russian Federation. The LAMPDR has maintained uh, good and solid relations with Lao PDR, and we have continued to build upon this momentum of good corporations, and we have received so much benefits from Boba, uh, also through the uh, humanitarian assistance, the ODA, and also increased trade and investment relations between the two countries, and we are also seeing a surge in tourists, uh, Russian tourists. And I think these are some of the benefits that we uh, get from our uh, relations with Russia. 
And of course, one of the most important and remarkable achievement is the uh, corporations in human capital development back in the USR era. And you are seeing that high-ranking leaders of Lao PDR have always have also graduated from uh, the USSR. And um, currently, uh, the relations between Russia and Laos, as you may know that we have Laos-China Railway, and this is one of the strategic, uh, strategic projects that we should utilize, especially to extend the Laos-China Railway to Australia, because I believe that if we could realize an extension of railway to Russia, we could benefit a great deal and also facilitate trade and investment between the two countries. And of course, uh, particularly uh, facilitating pa passenger transportation between Laos, uh, from Lao PDR to Russia through China. And I think this is um, an area that we should further explore in order to promote and deepen trade and investment relations between Russia and Lao PDR. And I hope that the two countries could actually explore and bring a uh, tangible benefit. Well, you, our moderator just mentioned pioneers uh, and the pioneers movement that still exists in Laos and that exists as an organization there. And uh, just now, Madam uh, Vice President have been to a children's camp we have uh, here in the region, and she mentioned that children from Laos come to have their holidays there. And this is wonderful. It's great that they have very good, friendly relations with uh, their friends from Laos and friends from Russia. Children from these two countries are making friendship there. And I would also say that children from Laos are not just having their holidays there. They are also studying here in Suvorov military schools in Russia. Oh, that's wonderful. So we have the Laos students in the Suvorov Military Academy. Yes, and this is wonderful. Well, for foreign guests, just to clarify that those are military schools for children. So uh, young children go there, get trained to later go to military academies. Well, since we're, st yeah, so just to add step by step, we're moving there gradually, but surely slow and steady wins the race and this is how we recover our relationship with our Lao friends to the full extent. This is wonderful since we started talking about logistics. Ten years anniversary is the anniversary one belt one road that we're having uh, this year with China. There is also a project of major Eurasian partnership and after G20 forum it was lately announced and those were the countries the United States, EU, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Jordan and India have completed their work on a historic, as it was stated, agreement of the new economic corridor between India, Middle East all the way to Europe. Russia is not included in this corridor. Um, China is not included either. How do you think how will that impact our projects and the project that we have to China? What does it mean for us? I think that will only benefit us and it will only help us in developing logistics. First and foremost, this project has been discussed for several years by now. Although the United States of America decided to jump into the project in the very last moment, although I do not really see any rationale for them to be in this project, Maybe it's purely important for them in terms of certain business interests. At the same time, the additional movement of cargo along this corridor is basically a complement to the North South Corridor project that we develop on our own. So there is nothing that could interfere with that. The North South Transportation Corridor allows us to leave the Persian Gulf and India. If there will be one more route added, I think that also includes Israel, then we can go through the Black Sea all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. This is the corridor we can use. I don't know. Those colleagues who presented the project should definitely take a look at that in details. But so far, it's just a memorandum of an, a declaration of intentions. We should look at the unit economics of the project. 
because at first the cargo has to be carried by rail to make sure it reaches the sea, then the cargo transshipment from the railway to the sea vessels, then it should arrive on shore either the shore of the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, and then there is yet another transshipment from the sea vessels to the railway. So this double transshipment has a particular meaning for the whole feasibility of the project, and that has to be carefully calculated. Well, we have with us the representative of the leading railway company of Russia, Russian Railways, Uh, that is Oleg Belazorov, who is nodding head right now. So apparently I'm saying the right thing if he can confirm that. Uh, the feasibility of the project is vital, so it has to be carefully calculated. Time-wise, if we compare the trip from the Northern Europe from St. Petersburg all the way to Mumbai, well, it would be more or less comparable to our route uh, along the North-South Corridor. But again, feasibility is a separate matter. I would assume that our project and our route would be more efficient. And of course, there will remain an interest towards the use of the Suez Canal. And assuming that it would cause some damage to the transportation via Suez Canal, well, that I do not believe. And the final point I wanted to make, the scope of cargo transportation is going up, it is growing every year, and it seems to me the more routes of the kind are available, the better. Thank you very much. And now, if I may, a few words to go back to the country. We are in Vladivostok right now. This is the city where you get to see a lot of cars uh, driven on the right side, like imported from Japan. And I guess that would split the audience into two parts. Many ways say that there are no options. Some would say it's okay. Well, I guess you are very lucky, Mr. President. You are driving Aurus, Neva, and Volga. Well, many Russian state officials are less so lucky because you told them that they will have to start using Russian-produced cars. In the 90s, there was an attempt of the kind to be made, but it failed dramatically. What is the guarantee that this time you will succeed? And what are the Russian-produced cars they can drive now? Well, back in the 90s, there were not too many cars available. Now we have those cars. Well, probably they are somewhat modest compared to Mercedes or Audi that were only being procured in the 90s in huge numbers. But I guess in this regard, we should learn from many partners of ours, namely our partners in India. They are mostly focusing on production and use of the cars and vessels produced in India. And in this regard, Prime Minister Modi is doing the right thing by encouraging people to use the brand made in India. We have those vehicles available as well, and we should make use of it. It is absolutely adequate, and it does not violate any obligations or commitments of ours under the WTO that is a solely a matter of state procurement, and we need to put in place a certain uh, hierarchy understanding who is to drive which type of car and make sure that we are driving Russian-produced cars. You probably have heard that there were some proposals to continue this procurement. It's not complicated. It can be easily done. Logistics is in place. You mean the procurement of foreign-produced cars, correct. But. I said that I have strong doubt whether we should really continue those state procurements. Uh, all of the government and the presidential office will put in place the proper structure to make sure we are all driving Russian cars. When do I go to see the first state officials uh, driving Russian cars? Well, very soon. We're about to start the procurement. It's only a practical matter to start the procurement. Frankly speaking, I do not know the exact date, but it will be really soon. Now, I will also have a question on Chinese cars. The import of Chinese cars to Russia has increased by 543 percent. According to the forecast this year, almost half a million Chinese cars will be imported to Russia. Aren't you worried that um, they will destroy the Russian cars in competition now will be dependent from the Chinese manufacturers? No, we develop this project together. And
Well, we now have an assembly point for the Haval cars in the Tula region. Uh, the assembly lines are here in Russia, and those are good, decent cars. We are developing Russian cars as well, and that's good. It's only good that we develop more and more using our own production sites and increasing the degree of localization. Uh, some would be produced in Moscow. Just lately, the mayor of Moscow reported to me on the progress in this regard. Uh, the same will apply to the Lada factory. We need to develop this production. Obviously, when our manufacturers were producing around 100% of cars that were only being assembled from foreign spare parts, from imported spare parts. Well, what kind of production is that? We need to increase the degree of localization. It certainly takes time, but this is the right thing to do in terms of development of the automobile industry in the country. We do not have any plans to self-isolate from the rest of the world, but begging anyone by standing on our knees, it's not something we're going to do. We developed ours, our own car, but it costs a lot. Yes, that's true, but that's because the production is not massive. Once the production gets massive, it will get two times cheaper. It takes time, true, but that will be development of our own. And that is about acquiring competences and uh, getting taxes paid inside Russia, creating more workplaces. It goes without saying. Now, there are important elements that are very positive in this regard, and we are open for cooperation with those who are willing to cooperate. But state officials definitely should be driving Russian cars. Well, a matter related to cars and fuel prices is my next topic. You are personally keeping control of the fuel prices, but the latest data shows that diesel costs more than 61 rubles per liter. Uh, Petrol is also getting more expensive, and I see that many are questioning themselves what is happening. I see this discussion happening in all kinds of um, charts and WhatsApp. People are discussing the growing prices for fuel. Why is it happening in this manner? Are we going to correct this situation? Certainly, the government is engaged in this process, and I would say that in this regard, our fuel producers are right. The government should have reacted timely and in a due manner. The decisions were adopted in this regard, but just lately, in order to retain the parity between the prices on the external market and the domestic market. Later on, those mechanisms were abolished. But the government has not reacted timely to the changes that were happening in the global market due to the price increase for oil. However, this is the position that can be adjusted. Just lately, I discussed that with Igor Sechin. He has his own view on that. But generally, oil producers and the government have reached an agreement on how they're going to act in the nearest future. It is very important for us to provide agricultural producers. Well, yeah, the Ministry of Agriculture already expressed their concern over availability of diesel fuel. Yes, you're right. It is that there was a physical shortage of diesel, but now it is available again, and it is only a matter of price regulation. There were a number of mechanisms available, and back in 2009, the government of the Russian Federation has adopted uh, a certain solution on the matter. It was a very thick folder describing our steps and the process for interaction with the companies representing the fuel and energy sector of the country and the Russian government. It described all this process in details. It is still in force, but is no longer applied. Some other mechanisms are applied to the so-called damper mechanism. I explained earlier what's the point of that. It is about striking the balance between the prices at the domestic market and the external market. And uh, it was also reduced by half, and it is now less efficient as compared how efficient it was before. But the mechanism for that are known to us. There are achievements in place, and uh, I'm sure it will affect the situation. I also have a question on the accounts chamber. Starting from November last year, it has not had a leader heading this institution. What's the re reason? Uh, was Mr. Kudrin so good in what he was doing that it's hard to find a replacement for him? Well, first and foremost, uh, it's not that we have slavery here, so I can't force a person to stay and work at the council chamber if they want to go and 
work and private business, they're free to do so. Although he was a great minister of finance, he was doing a great job as the head of the Chamber of Accounts, but the Chamber of Accounts is still functioning effectively. It is conducting thousands of audits. As far as I know, uh, they have detected the violations uh, and tax areas to the amount of 1.6 trillion rubles. But they have an acting lead who is managing the work of their account. It is working well. And I guess but by the moment the situation is rife, when the parliament chooses the right candidate to take this position, I'm sure the matter will be resolved. So it's not something that is interfering with the work of the account. There is a reason why I've mentioned Yandex. Just lately, there was an official website established by Arkady Volosh, and this website uh, states the following, and I quote, Israeli entrepreneur born in Kazakhstan, the co-founder, one of the largest internet company in Europe, Yandex. Just to remind you, Volosh was born in 1964 when Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union, but his current biography he doesn't say a single word on the Soviet Union. There is a number of other businessmen in Russia who openly express their position and their views on the special military operation. So to you personally, where is this border that one cannot cross and that cannot be done by even those who create something so important for the country as Yandex. Look, it's not me defining this border. This border should exist within the conscious, within the minds of those people who make certain statements. As a rule, that is normally explained by the desire of those individuals, those businessmen, to retain their businesses and assets, the more so if those individuals decided to relocate to another country. Well, uh, the particular individual now lives in Israel, and I can imagine that in order to live there well, having a good quality of life and enjoying good relations to the local authorities, he may be forced to make certain statements. He has been quite he has kept quiet for quite a long while. Now he decided to make this statement. Well, I wish him a good. Uh, let him have a good life there. We are not offended by that. But generally, if we take a look at this situation, well, if the person has grown in this country, studied there, received their education here, achieved success in this country, well, it's a matter of conscience and self-esteem and being fair um, towards the country that has given him everything. I'm not talking specifically about Mr. Volosh. He's a talented businessman. He's created a great company. He has a great team in place. But generally, imagine such a situation. I can imagine easily that the person disagrees to what the current authorities do. Are those persons allowed to express their viewpoints? Certainly. But there are many nuances to that. You can do it differently. You can take a position of our geopolitical foes and rivalries, and you can play in their hands and by doing so, causing damage to your own country. Or you could act differently. Again, there are many nuances, and it is always to this person to define for themselves how they want to act. Who are they to themselves? Does this person have any kind of national consciousness? Or is that the person who is willing to pretend to be somebody else and simply no longer feel being a Russian citizen, somebody born in the Soviet Union, but be somebody completely different. Well, it is the choices we make. And I can assure you that regular citizens of Russia feel it all perfectly well, and they understand it well. You can't deceive people by doing that. Well, if the person has chosen a new destiny uh, for them, well, let them try. Uh, let them achieve some result by doing that, because no matter who this person is, no matter what results they achieve, they could have done it here. Well, they have done it here already, but they can't be sure that they will do the same in another country. But this is about their choices. Talking about the new destiny, as a follow-up, in June there was an article of independent expert in Glasgow in the issues on economy. 
Yes, I'm aware about it, but I'm just talking it uh, to the audience. I'm aware, I'm sure that you know. And uh, it's uh, the uh, failure uh, to make the settlements in the 90s in uh, a Russian. Do you know who the author is? It is an independent British uh, scientist. Do you trust British scientists on the whole? I trust scientists. It doesn't matter what their nationality is. And uh, if uh, the research is uh, respectable, I do not only trust, but uh, I admire their work and uh, life because the true scientists uh, are immersed in the subject matter that uh, they are working on. And uh, it is just the, the matter of their life the business of their life uh, and uh, they do not spare their life even and there are so many examples of such scholars and scientists but if they're just uh, making fun well then uh, we realize that these are not uh, scientists uh, they are just uh, doing that for the amusement of the public let them make fun let them fool around but of course uh, uh, for fun one can uh, go to the circus to see the things over there but what Anat mr anatoly chubais uh, did it? I don't know. And uh, I saw a picture for, of his documents uh, on the web. Uh, and uh, he is not uh, Anatoly, but Moshe Israelevich uh, in Israel. I don't know why he's doing that. He left uh, and he ran away. And uh, the reason might be that uh, there are some. Uh, complicated uh, things uh, happening in uh, the company that uh, he has been chairing for quite some time. There is a budget gap uh, over there, financial hole in uh, the corporation that uh, he has been heading. That's true. I'm not going to throw figures at you, but uh, it is huge. And uh, thanks uh, God uh, there is no criminal uh, case at the moment, and uh, there might be the reason uh, he is uh, apprehensive uh, that uh, in the long run it would uh, result in some criminal case, and uh, that's uh, why he's now living undercover in Israel. I don't know why he needs to do that. It is uh, the opinion, well, yours is the opinion of the person who has been working in Dresden. So it's ridiculous. And uh, he's a smart person. I didn't read the article. I, I don't know. Well, maybe there are some uh, substantial and uh, reasonable things over there. But uh, anyway, he has been the head of the large uh, company which was uh, created for the development of nanotechnologies, uh, at least uh, both uh, from the economic and financial point of view. He did not succeed in his work. A question, though strange as it is, about uh, privatization and deprivatization. There is an idea of new privatization, and uh, it's uh, the topic that is high on the agenda of the big business and that is discussed over here at the margin of uh, the uh, forum, deprivatization is uh, the phenomenon when the assets uh, are taken by the state. And there were a few cases like that. And the businessmen say that, uh, well, we do not understand whether the rules of the games have changed and uh, what the future should bring us. And uh, the situation is quite acute. How can you comment on that? No, there is uh, no ideas or there'll be no deprivatization in the future at all. I can assure you that will not happen. The prosecutor's office uh, are proactive. They are working in uh, some uh, industries regarding some of the companies, uh, but the law enforcement uh, agencies, bodies, they have the right to assess what is uh, happening in the economy and regarding the specific cases of the business activity, but it is not related to the decisions taken regarding the deprivatization. The, the deprivatization will not happen, and Igor is aware about my position. Well, he's nodding. So uh, there'll be uh, no pressure exerted on the business, no. 
but uh, everyone should uh, follow the should be law abiding of uh, the applicable law if uh, not then they should be ready that the prosecutor's uh, office and the investigation committee and uh, the audit uh, chamber will uh, be monitoring the situation in uh, the economy and uh, they will be called upon all the actors uh, to observe the applicable law but uh, prosecuting somebody who that are just uh, engaged in honest business no that will not happen i would like to emphasize uh, right away it uh, regards it is regarding the current situation the russian business is uh, behaving responsibly the may keep jobs, uh, they set up new supply chains, uh, they are proactive in doing that. Of course, uh, there is a demand uh, for the emergence of a new class of businessmen. That is true. But no one is saying that uh, it is necessary to start deprivatization and uh, to change the ownership uh, of the assets. Mr. Shahin has given an interview, and uh, there is a quote, and uh, he said, there is a, a question regarding the new owners uh, of the nationalized uh, assets. And so if uh, the new... Uh, what is happening with uh, the property. There are procedures prescribed by the law, and uh, if uh, the assets uh, become the ownership uh, of the state, uh, then they can dispose of it and through open tender. Talking about uh, the private initiative, on the 12th of September 1957, Russia has uh, launched uh, the interstellar station Luna 2, and it was uh, the first uh, satellite that uh, made it to the moon. And let's applaud those uh, that uh, are engaged in this business, but not Luna 25 station. It failed. Don't you think we should uh, invite some private initiative for space exploration? Mr. Elon Musk uh, is quite successful. Aren't you disappointed that uh, we are losing the leading positions in the space exploration? No, it's okay. It's a complicated uh, endeavor did, uh, related uh, to the high tech. We have great competences regarding the landing of uh, the satellite uh, to in the area which uh, no entity has uh, landed yet. It's a complicated matter. Well, we will uh, analyze the, the situation. This work will uh, still be ongoing. Too bad uh, the, the satellite, uh, the, the station did not uh, land over there, but we will continue the work. And uh, there were similar cases, uh, accidents, uh, incidents uh, with uh, the other nations. And uh, sometimes uh, the accidents were even more severe. So it is related to the uncertainties, so nothing unusual. We wish uh, we, we had been successful, but uh, anyway, we will continue these efforts and some other uh, endeavors. As far as private business is concerned, and Mr. Alan Musk, uh, he is an outstanding personality, recognized uh, globally. He is a proactive and talented businessman. And of course, he is successful in many areas with the support of the U.S. state. And uh, we, as a state, we intend uh, to develop this work. And uh, Roscosmos uh, entity has uh, already taken a decision to invite a private uh, initiative, and uh, we are doing that already. And you will be go visiting the Vostochny Cosmodrome. What uh, can we expect from your visit? I have uh, my agenda, and uh, you will come to know it. So the something related to Russia and uh, the Far East, you have mentioned that 12 million people live behind the Urals, and the uh, 
550,000 people have uh, left uh, the region. Why do you think, despite all the measures uh, taken, we did not manage to uh, stop the exodus? Well, uh, not that easy. If uh, there is a trend, negative trend, it's very difficult uh, to reverse it. It is uh, related uh, to many factors, and uh, non-specialist uh, laymen cannot uh, understand it. It is related to the standard of life and priorities uh, that households uh, and uh, productive uh, age women have. They intend to get uh, education, then to continue career. The first uh, child is born when uh, a woman is uh, 30 years old, and uh, there is no second child. As far as Russia is concerned, and the specialists are aware about that, uh, there are two declines uh, in the birth rate, and uh, it uh, gave us uh, few people that are capable of uh, producing uh, new uh, children. It is uh, 1943, 1944, when well, there was a decline in the birth rate, and the early 90s. and. Uh, when Anatoly Chubais uh, was uh, at the a top dog, that was happening. We can, uh, of course, uh, take fun, uh, poke fun at that, but uh, they did a lot uh, to switch over to open market uh, economy in uh, Russia. And uh, hard to say who could have done better and what. It is. Uh, easy to criticize the things, but uh, they have undertaken drastic measures, and uh, it resulted in the collapse of the soft infrastructure, poverty, and uh, drastic drop uh, in the birth rate, similar to the time of the Second World War in 1943-44. And so these uh, two drops uh, reproduce themselves uh, with the, the period of uh, 10, 15 years. And uh, we get into this demographic uh, pitfall. And uh, there are people who, uh, are, uh, who can produce uh, children, but uh, they are very few. However, there are many measures uh, are taken to offset it. We, there was time when the high birth rate was uh, quite high, but uh, what shall we pay attention to? It is uh, increasing the lifespan, and it is coming up. In, 19, in uh, 2021, the lifespan was uh, 71, and now it is uh, 73 years plus. I think it is 73.6, and uh, in June, I think, uh, 2023, it was uh, 74 plus, if we compare it versus the previous year. The second thing to take into account, the mortality is uh, down. There is uh, another way out. It is uh, to increase uh, migration level. So we should pay attention to all these uh, demographic factors. You have mentioned that uh, we have a range of uh, measures to give support to children with families, uh, to support uh, maternity and parenthood. We have the so-called maternity capital that is paid out uh, to families with the birth of their first and second child. And uh, so we should uh, keep going. We should invest into health care sector. That's what we will be doing. And uh, some time ago, we have uh, registered the natural growth of the population. Unfortunately, the, we didn't manage uh, to keep the trend going. But anyway, we should uh, try. As far as uh, the awareness uh, is concerned, we should uh, enhance uh, the, the prestige, the image of maternity and uh, parenthood, paternity. We should incite people to have a large family, and we should uh, strengthen the Russian traditional values, religious values as well. So it's a, a lot of work, but all the society should do that. My grand 
mother was the tenth child in the family. We do not have that many families. Why not? We do. We try to give support to, to large families and have ten children and even more. The question which is not related to the demography. Demography is only uh, calculated uh, d to have uh, the population of 146 million than it will be necessary to bring in uh, 390,000 of uh, migrants uh, for 80 years. Altogether, 1.1 millions of uh, migrants will be needed every year. Don't you think that there is a, a hazard interest uh, associated with it uh, when there are some regions in the U.S. and other countries w which become so com so difficult that even the police uh, is uh, apprehensive of entering such regions. Of course, uh, we should not allow that happening in our countries, and this is very sensitive in the life of our society. And of course, the economy calls uh, for import for bringing in labor migrants in the civil engineering sector. I think 13 percent, correction, 33 percent of the labor force are migrants. But altogether, uh, the migrants are not that many. It is 3.7 percent. And uh, altogether, the labor force is, uh, I think it is 12 plus a million people. I, I am not sure about the correct exact figure. So it is uh, quite a sensitive issue related to both the economy and the community life, social sphere, and the morale of the society. And by the way, it is uh, much more easier for us the, than in the West, for the U.S., because we have an influx of people coming from the former republics of the Soviet Union. It is easier for us uh, to work uh, with uh, them and the leaders of those countries understand how the things are. And we have uh, special programs with uh, some countries uh, of uh, conditioning these uh, migrants uh, prior to them entering this country. We give them a chance uh, to study Russian, the Russian language, the laws uh, of uh, Russia, and uh, they are made to understand that they, if they come to Russia, they have to understand the culture and traditions of uh, Russia. And it is necessary to work uh, with them in uh, Russia as well. And it is important uh, for the Russian citizens as well. And uh, they do not uh, need uh, to have some kind of irritating factor. But uh, first of all, we should think about the interests of the citizens of the Russian Federation. But if we are talking about the influx of the migrants, we should choose uh, those people that uh, we need for the development uh, of the economy. And th there is another way, there is another technique. It is both easy and difficult. It is easy in the respect that we won't need that many migrants if provided we introduce uh, the new state-of-the-art technologies uh, that help us to save on manpower. But it needs uh, to address the other issue of technological development of this uh, country to uh, update uh, the infrastructure. Large investments are needed, and uh, the work is uh, being carried on. But uh, the way out uh, are not difficult. We should work, and that's what we will be doing. Now I will ask a question that, with each passing day, is becoming more and more acute. I'll start with the fact that the regional um, elections just took place. They took place for three days, and several, some of them took place in the Far Eastern region as well. Let's congratulate those who won in those elections. Three years ago, when you were asked whether you've made a decision to take part in the presidential election, you've said, no, you haven't made a decision back then. Now we have we are six months away. Are you still thinking about it? According to the law, the decision is made is to be made by the parliament at the end of the year. So when the decision is made, when the elections are announced, when we know the date, we'll talk about it then. OK, I will have a chance to ask again. Now, I'll ask you about the presidential elections in the U.S. What do you expect of them? They, they are to take pl place next year, especially since there are a lot of 
strange things happening there. We understand that Mr. Trump might be arrested at any moment. Why should we think about it? I think that there will be no principal changes in the foreign policy of the U.S. regarding Russia, whoever is elected as a president. Though we do hear that Mr. Trump, that he'll decide in a few days the most acute, acute issues such as the Ukrainian crisis, for example, well, that is heartwarming, that's great, but though he was um, accused of special ties with Russia, though this is um, gibberish and nonsense. But he introduced the most sanctions among all other presidents against Russia. So what is to be expected of the next president, whoever that is, it's hard for us to say, but it is unlikely that there will be a sea change in their policy since the current authorities have um, grown the anti-Russian sentiment among the, society, the U.S. society. That's what they did, but it's hard to um, turn the trend around. First, they see Russia as ex existential uh, rival or even an enemy, and they are putting that idea in the heads of s simple Americans, though that really creates a sentiment in the society, though there are a lot of people in the U.S who would like to build good, friendly, business-like relations with us. Moreover, many of them share our positions, first and foremost, in terms of maintaining the so-called traditional values. We have many friends there and many like-minded people, but they're being silenced. So we do not know who will be elected, but whoever that is, as I said, the general trend anti-Russian trend of, of the policy is unlikely to change. Sorry. Now, as for the Trump persecution, well, for us, what's happening in today's conditions, I think this is good. Why? Because it shows how nefarious the U.S. political system is, how corrupt it is, and it cannot lay a claim to teach others democracy. What's happening with Mr. Trump is persecution by political motives of their political competition. That is what is that. And it's done in the eyes of the U.S. Um, society and the rest of the world. They've just laid bare their domestic issues. And in that sense, if they're trying to counter us in some ways, that's good because it shows who is against us. As they said in the Soviet times, it just shows the um, the grin, um, the animal grin of the American capitalism. I'd like to give yet another quote, but I will not say who's the author. I'll say it in the end. When studying Chinese, Thai, or any other culture, there is a need to study its specifics. As for the Russian thousands of years of Christian Christendom, in majority, the Western researchers only have su surprised why the strange world and continent did not adopt the Western thinking and did not follow the so apparent Western path. Russia is judged for everything that is, well, in, in terms of what, what it is unlikely, un unlike the, the West. This is a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who left Russia, who lived in the West, and later returned. What do you think is the reason behind such attitude towards us? First of all, I'd like to say that my personal um, conversation with Alexander Solzhenitsyn has convinced me that he was a true, real patriot of Russia. To a certain extent, he was a nationalist in, in a good sense of the word, in a civilized, in a civilized sense of this word. So the fact that he said such words, they're not surprising for me. That's number one. Number two, everything that has to do with the relations between Russia and the West has to do with the geopolitical interests of the Western states. Their attacks on all fronts, also in, in spiritual sphere, 
That is just the continuation of this geopolitical standoff. Naturally, the West um, has been trying for a long time to Catholicize Russia to move it onto the purview of the Holy See. When that was not successful, they were trying to find all kinds of tools. The tools how to present our country as an empire of evil, though it was coined by Reagan, but in practice that has been coming from the Middle Ages or even before, probably. Every time Russia became stronger, became a true geopolitical competitor, competitor, mind you. Then right away they were trying to um, do uh, contain Russia. Now the West is trying to contain Chinese development because they're seeing that under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and our friend, president of. Uh, of China, they're, they're trying to steamy that growth. They're doing everything in their power to put a break on its growth, but they're too, they're, they've been too late. Um, this ship has sailed. This is an objective trend. Well, it's not only about China. India, Indonesia, new centers of power will be developing. And now what some Western countries are doing, led by the U.S., such attempts to contain other countries will only uh, harm them. Um, well, Lee, could you tell us a secret? Well, I, I cannot tell you a secret. I used to work at the, in the KGB. Now, if you could share the information then. When President Xi traveled here, I remember the video when you were saying goodbye to them. And um, he said that you've started changes that haven't been in the place for 100 of years. What did he mean by that? Well, you know, we spoke for four hours, you know, just one-on-one. -on -one. There were a lot of details and nuances there. The only thing I can say that, indeed, over the past years, we've achieved unprecedented level of our relations. And that applies to all spheres of our interaction. Today, we've met with a Chinese delegation. According to Chinese statistics, the volume is of, of our trade is even higher than according to our statistics. I think we have every chance. I don't know whether it would work or not. There are a lot of um, short-time changes in, in currencies and economic, but maybe we'll achieve a trade of 200 billion. Well, the specific figures do not matter that much. The thing is that we're actively developing our cooperation. Indeed, we have amazing relations in international security and in harmonizing of our positions. We're working in the interests of each other. We try to listen to each other on the most crucial matters, to listen to each other and to hear and to respond at the governmental level, at the level of heads of state, at the ministerial level in terms of dialogue between uh, military and security agencies. Our cooperation has reached un unprecedented heights. Well, what's interesting, we, we haven't created a military union. We're not being friends against someone. We're being friends in the interests of our nations, and that's how we'll continue to work. That sounds very well in terms of China, but there are some issues as well. I've spoke to the businesses and what they're saying that the China is not too happy opening production in Russia. They're mainly prepared to export ready-made goods. We cannot say that our market is, that their market is prepared for that. We don't see uh, instruments in, in, in Russian capital market. So what what's the issue there? Well, China is, uh, an independent country, and it proceeds from its own interests. It's the same thing that we do. Saying that we do not respond to each other's um, desires, well, that's not quite true. One of such sensitive issues is opening of the Chinese market for, for Russian coal, for Russian miners. 
Well, China also has certain matters, certain issues in the coal sector that would also like their miners to to send coal to the domestic market. Still, they're opening their market. They're doing that, and quite a big share. We still cannot agree on pork. Well, you have to understand that they, they have their own contract. The government does not really interfere in relations with businesses who have already established ties. But we need to solve other matters, for example, with the African swine fever. Yes, uh, that happened. That was an issue. We need to solve it. These all are ongoing matters that requires work at a different level of, of our interaction. And we are making headway on each and every one of them. I'm positive that all of the issues will be solved, including the ones that you've touched upon. We also need to be more proactive and to show our advantages. Chinese partners respond to that. Is it that they are not opening um, new productions? What did they open in Tula? Um, uh, a car factory. Yes, a car factory. But they also need to take a look at the market, how much investment they're going to make, what will be the return on their investment. So it's a matter on our side that we need to decide on and to provide favorable conditions to investors. We have good interaction in high tech. We continue to build nuclear power plants in China, and quite a lot of them. Now, that's something where where we're an undisputed leader and we're showing very good results, both domestically and internationally. And Chinese partners appreciate that, and they give us this these sites for building and so on, though they have their own nuclear um, energy sector developing. However, considering certain competitive advantages of our proposals, our offers, they're still doing it. We also need to agree on in terms of large body airplanes, wide body airplanes. But yes, we, we need to continue negotiations there, but we'll continue. In terms of helicopter building, where we have apparent advantages globally, we're working there jointly together with the Chinese. And helicopters with uh, car with uh, large payloads. We also work on that. We are also working in space, though we have some issues and we have some competitive advantages. And they are very happy working together. But we need to acknowledge that the People's Republic of China, under the current leadership, I'd like to highlight that has achieved tremendous results in high tech. We need to discuss it with them and we're doing it. So we need to have a discussion and to see the way they are going to benefit from cooperation with us, also to provide them with favorable conditions. This is just regular doing business, regular things, but it's it has a very solid, good foundations of mutual trust. And I'm sure that we'll continue moving forward. Now, you spoke about high tech. I don't know if you know, but right now, China has scared the U.S. by producing their own 7 nanometer chip, and they've um, put it in the smartphone. Well, that's not the way why they're scary. They're large. They have 1.5 billion, and they have a surging economy. That's why they're scared. So, yes, that's the issue. But chips are important, but it's just one of the elements of that. Several questions uh, following up on the topic of Solzhenitsyn. In July, special correspondent Andrei Kolesnikov, who tomorrow will write about this plenary session, uh, will we believe it will be a wonderful article. So Mr. Kolesnikov spoke to you and um, uh, mentioned that um, drew a comparison of the 1937 and 19 and 2023. But I have a different simil in mind. It was 1922, the philosopher's steamship. Well, people were made to leave from the country. It was done by the Bolsheviks. They were made to leave the 
the Soviet Union. Right now, those who disagree leave on their own. They are not being expelled. However, the country is again losing talented people. What do you think about this loss and what it would mean for the Russian development? You know, each person makes his own choice. We already spoke about that. Using different statistics, the journalists have counted as for culture figures about 160, 170 people left for abroad. They disagree with the policy of the of the Russian government. You may disagree with the, with the policy of the Russian state and stay here and to speak about that while it's not forbidden. But someone preferred to leave. It has to do not only with the people's with the position position that they disagree, I mean, the culture figures that disagree with the Russian state. It also has to do with uh, material well-being as well. They bought a lot of houses and apartments abroad. They have uh, banking accounts abroad. People don't want to lose that. They're f afraid that we'll lose it. That's one of the reasons. I'm not saying that it's the only, but still, they're leaving for abroad, and they're demanded that they have to, in order to maintain their assets, they have to be vocal, they have to be um, criticizing Russia and so on. So that's what they do. Well, I'll reiterate that there are people who disagree full-heartedly with what the Russian state is doing, the Russian authorities. But I'll reiterate, the, they, they could criticize from here, but they decided to leave. Well, it's their decision. What about Russian culture? Did it suffer from that? Well, maybe when a person is talented, he, who would have been able to do something here, maybe we've lost something when he or she left. But maybe, maybe he'd be better off doing that abroad, in the broad the interests that they, they they want to service. But instead of doing it here, promoting some non-traditional values and affecting the brains of our citizens? Well, it's a, it's a tough question, but um, each person is responsible for his own destiny. Well, we have everything working, theaters, concert halls, exhibitions, many artists uh, traveling to the uh, special military operation zone. They're supporting our guys, our heroes there at the f forefront. Well, they've done this choice. They've made it. And for sure, they're doing everything that they're doing in the interest of the Russian people. Most likely today or tomorrow, the migrants of the new wave will be reading up about this plenary session abroad. And it's important for them to understand whether they are all free to go back to Russia or not. Well, they've traveled there and they're a free will. Well, we, we cannot close the ban them from traveling back. According to the Russian legislation, the Russian citizen is free to choose where he lives, but he cannot be um, denied his citizenship and banned from traveling back to Russia. Another question, the so-called transformation of punishment, you know, exile, banishment, that's what was used during the Tsarist Russia and the USSR repression purges. Uh, psych words and right now there's this foreign agent tag and I have made some calculations the number of such organizations or people is at more than 400 and each week there are new names entering into the list of the so-called foreign agents so uh, and what about the you know lifting of this name this label can you cease to be a foreign agent. Well, uh, we actually replicate the same law that was applied in the U.S. It was adopted back in 1957, or 37. And uh, actually, in the U.S., uh, it's far less liberal than the uh, law on foreign agents in Russia. In Russia, a foreign agent is someone who is doing social work, uh, socially significant work, uh, using the money uh, got from outside sources and the law does not prevent the foreign agent from doing that. You only have to uh, reveal your sources, you know. You know, he who pays 
orders the music. So if you get money from abroad, you have to state where you get your money from. Yes, there are some nuances, and the human rights defenders have drawn my attention to these nuances on multiple occasions. The thing is, uh, this law covers those uh, people who are not truly involved in public activities. They work in environment or in some other fields, and we are introducing adjustments into the law. And I am always asking the Prosecutor General's Office and the in investigative officers and others to come up with proposals on improving this procedure. Well, if you're asking how this status is lifted, I can tell you that it can be lifted and you need a court decision, a court ruling to do that. A question about Ukraine. Just recently, Antony Blinken, State Secretary, has visited Ukraine. He gave an interview to ABC, and in that interview, he said that Ukraine is willing to engage in talks with Russia, and he added that the terms and the future border is going to depend on the opinion of Ukraine. He also said that peace talks are currently unattainable because it takes two to tango, and currently Russia does not want to talk. Can you comment on that? And secondly, where does this position come from? Um, did the um, State Secretary hear your speech in Sochi when you said that the current counteroffensive had failed? And moreover, why is uh, the State Secretary making such uh, announcements on behalf of Ukraine? Well, you should ask the last bit of him. As far as the negotiating process is concerned, if the U.S. believes that the that Ukraine is ready to engage in talks, then Ukraine needs to lift the presidential decree that prevents Ukraine from engaging in talks. There is a presidential decree, and by that decree, he prevented, he banned himself and all the rest from entering into talks. Blinken says that Ukraine is ready. Well, then this decree, to start with, needs to be lifted. Then moving on, generally, I believe myself and many others understand that Ukraine is currently engaged in the so-called counteroffensive, which is yielding no results. We're not going to be saying whether that's a failure or not. The losses are there, and the losses are big. From the beginning of the counteroffensive, the losses are at 71,000 people, pe pe soldiers. They say that they want to achieve some results at any price. Sometimes it seems as if these are not their own people, I mean, those whom they are sending to the counteroffensive, as if those were not Ukrainian citizens. Well, that's what the officers are reporting me from the battlefields. Do you talk to them? Yes, all the time. So the losses are very huge, uh, 543 tanks, uh, as far as armored vehicles are concerned, almost 18,000. So one gets the impression that, you know, the Western is trying to nudge them to take as large a chunk as possible. And once all the resources, human resources, material resources, munitions have been exhausted, once that happens, they want a ceasefire, and then they say, well, it's been a long time since we've been saying that we want talks, and then they would like to resume. They want talks in order to replenish their resources and their arms. Well, this tactics is a possibility, one of the options. But if they sincerely want to achieve something through negotiations, then they should do it. It is up to the Ukrainians to say that. It's up to them to lift that presidential decree, to make a statement. Because publicly, they've stated that they're not going to be involved in talks. Right now, they need to publicly state that they are going to enter into talks. And I don't think it's going to do any damage to their reputation. That's it. What can be the first step on their side, after which we will be ready to engage in talks? Well, listen, for many sides, I mean, the people whom I, am, whom 
I'm talking to who want to act as intermediaries. They are asking me, are you ready to stop the hostilities? But can, how can we stop the hostilities when the other side is involved in a counteroffensive? What are we supposed to do? They're going to mount their counteroffensive and we uh, we will say that we'll stop the hostilities when all Trotskyists, when, you know, movement is everything, the destination is nothing. That would be the wrong theory. So basically, first Kiev needs to stop the hostilities and show some proof, and then we will be willing to talk. Well, I told you, first they need to lift the presidential decree that bans them from engaging in talks, and they need to make a statement that they are willing to engage in talks, and then we'll even see. A couple of words about the arms, uh, the supplies, the weapon supplies, and then a question to Madam Vice President. A decision has been made to supply depleted uranium munitions to Ukraine, and now there are talks that uh, longer range missiles of up to 300 kilometers are also going to be sent to Ukraine first. Do you think it is going to help to uh, change the situation drastically at the front line? And how are we going to respond? Well, we've spoken about that, but I'm going to repeat that. Just recently, the U.S. administration thought the use of cluster munitions to be a war crime. They used to say that publicly. Right now, the U.S. is supplying cluster munitions to the battlefield in Ukraine, all while saying that neither U.S. nor Russia has signed the uh, Convention on Cluster Munitions. But uh, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that in the past, they used to say that it was a war crime, but they're the ones supplying the cluster munitions right now, and they don't give a damn about what others think about them, they only serve their own interests. They have made the calculations, the 155 caliber munitions are running out and it's difficult to produce both in the US and Europe and they are providing what they have in store. If they've got cluster munitions, that will do depleted uranium munitions, that will do too. So that is where the war crime is. and. Well, they said it was the crime, and they're the ones doing that. But it's no view of no use. Well, they've been uh, providing cluster munitions for quite some time. Uh, yes, it deals some damage to us. Uh, now they're going to supply the depleted uranium munitions, and it's going to infect the environment. Uh, Grossi said there would be no infection, no contamination. Well, well we know what's going to happen. There is going to be some contamination there. And in this regard, well, it's been quite some time since the British have been providing these kinds of munitions. Has it changed anything? So, no, it hasn't changed anything. Are F-16 supplies going to change anything? No, uh, it's not going to change anything. You know, uh, there is going to be an electoral cycle and they are preparing for that, and they are pushing the Ukrainians to show some results because they have no pity for Ukrainians. And strange as it may sound, the Ukrainian leadership does not care, it does not have any pity for their own citizens, for the soldiers. They are simply sending them to that massacre. Is it going to prolong the conflict? Yes, it is. Well, let me tell you a story. Just recently, as a result of uh, armed clashes on our territory, the Federal Security Service eliminated several combatants and the others were taken, host uh, they were captured. And it turned out that it was a sabotage group from the Ukrainian special services. They were interrogated. They responded that their goal was to do damage to one of our nuclear power plants. They were supposed to destroy a power line. Their objective was to sabotage the energy unit. And it 
had not been the first attempt of theirs. And it, they responded during the interrogation and said that they had been prepared by British instructors. Do they understand what they're doing? Are they trying to provoke us to make us respond against Ukrainian energy facilities? And does the British leadership know what their special services are doing? Maybe they are not aware of that. Well, uh, I agree, it's possible. And maybe the special services of Great Britain are acting at the behest of the U.S. American of the U.S. special services. We know the end, the, the beneficiary. Well, they they did know what Chernobyl was like. But after what I've just said, they're going to say that once again I'm trying to blackmail them or whatever. But what I'm saying is truth and nothing but the truth. So, yes, these people were interrogated and they gave us the answers and they were not forced to make these confessions. The British Special Services know that what I'm saying right now is the truth. And I don't understand uh, what's the stance of the British leadership on that. And, you know, such occurrences are truly concerning because they are going beyond the pale, but we're not going to strike against the nuclear energy facilities. I'm saying that maybe they're trying to provoke us. Madam Vice President, a question to you. You have spoken about cluster munitions. I think uh, the Vietnam War ended in 1975. Right now, those bombings and Lao PDR, how much did they affect the lives of common people? And uh, do you still feel that influence, that impact? Uh, on clustered munitions, as well as uh, unexploded ordinance, I think there are so many varieties that we have not yet uh, been able to clear. And we have been heavily affected by this unexploded ordinance. And we have been receiving humanitarian support as well as technical assistance from Russia as well as from international organization. And yet we have not yet been able to clear the land. And one of the most devastating impact on the people, on our people, is um, injury. And then also, there's also, and then it also caused the loss of life of parents and then resulting in a number of orphans in Lao PDR. And thirdly, this unexploded ordinance have been an obstacle to agricultural development. And usually, uh, the arable areas are heavily affected by cluster munitions. And therefore, the Lao government has been putting, um, uh, has been attaching great importance to address this humanitarian issues in partnership with Russia as well as with international organizations. And does the government of Laos PTR has an estimate how many times it's going to be required in order to fully demine the territories? Uh, the war in Laos lasted for over 30 years, and it is one of the longest war in history. And the use of cluster munition uh, is one, was one of the tactics in that war. And we have not yet calculated as to how many years we can actually completely clear this unexploded ordinance. But of course, uh, the Lao government has been working closely with international organizations and friendly countries to address this country as much as possible.
Thank you. Would you like to comment? No. I would just like to add that we are participating in the demining, but we're also training local specialists. We have already helped train 150 local specialists who are working in the field of demining. You know, I would like to ask you, Mr. President, about Armenia a year ago. Um, Prime Minister Pashinyan was here, and I uh, listened to your conversations in the couloirs. And yesterday, I think, the uh, military exercises between Armenia and the U.S. Uh, started. Uh, Prime Minister's wife uh, went to Kiev, and the Speaker of the Parliament also spoke very critically about <coughs> Russia. So why this pivot? And how is it going to affect the state of affairs on the border between Azerbaijan and Armenia? Well, I wouldn't call that a pivot. We see and understand what is happening. We could talk along about that. We proposed our own options for settlement. I'm not going to hide that. that. I think it's very well known. Armenia used to be in control of seven districts. It put under its control after the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. We proposed that they should come to an agreement with Azerbaijan so that two districts remain under the Armenian jurisdiction. But the Armenian leadership did not agree to that, even though we have been trying to persuade the Armenian leadership for decades, well, for 10 or 15 years. There were different options, but in the end, this is what it has boiled down to. When we asked, what are you going to do, they said, we're going to fight. In the end, it all resulted in the current state of affairs. But it's not just about the outcome of this last conflict. The thing is, Armenia's leadership essentially have recognized Azerbaijan's sovereignty over Nagorno-Karabakh. And in the Prague statement, it was enshrined and put on paper. We are aware of that. And right now, President Aliyev tells me, you know, Armenia has recognized that Nagorno-Karabakh belongs to us. The issue of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh has been resolved. It's no longer in suspense. Armenia has made the official statement uh, considering the territory before 1991 to be all Azerbaijan's and citing the figures, the surface figures that include the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. And it was not our decision. It was the decision of the current leadership of Armenia. And uh, right now, they say that we have to address any issues on a bilateral basis if you want to, to deal with Karabakh. So Armenia has basically recognized that Nagorno-Karabakh belongs to Azerbaijan. Yes, there are also humanitarian issues as well as the issue of the mandate of our peacekeepers. It's true that the mandate is still in force, whereas humanitarian issues such as you know, the prevention of ethnic purges, those issues are very urgent, very much in force, and I fully agree with that. And the leadership of Azerbaijan is not interested in any kind of ethnic purges. Quite the contrary, it's interested in this process being as smooth as possible. And how, uh, you know, uh, how justified are all the accusations that the Russia hasn't helped, the CSTO hasn't helped, there is a humanitarian catastrophe. But if they recognize that Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, well, that's it. This is the key element of the problem. The status of Karabakh has been determined by Armenia itself. That's it.
There is no more problem there. And a private uh, question. Uh, the president of Armenia talked to you because with France he talked. He sent me a letter. We keep maintaining our contact. There is no problems whatsoever between us and Armenia and between me and Pashinyan. We keep constant contact. Yet another important uh, question coming back to Ukraine again. Uh, they uh, talk a lot about possible new mobilization in Russia, in our country. What can you say to those who are listening to us? In Ukraine, they have forced mobilization, one wave after another. And I don't know how many they've mobilized. We've organized a partial mobilization. We've mobilized uh, several hundreds of, uh, two hundreds of uh, mobilized persons. For the last uh, seven months, six, seven months, every month, uh, a voluntary uh, contract to serve in the army, in the armed forces, uh, 270,000 persons during this six or seven uh, months. It's in addition to partial uh, mobilization. Yes, it's an addition. People come to uh, military recruitment units and sign uh, con uh, recruitment contract voluntarily. 270,000 persons. And this process is going on. Every day, one, from 1,000 to 1,500 persons come to sign uh, voluntarily their recruitment uh, contracts. That's what differ Russian people, Russian society from others. I don't know any other country where it could be possible. Um, people in full conscience, they join armed forces. In today's situation, they do understand that at the end, they will end up <clears throat> at the front line. And our men, our males, they do understand what they will face that they could uh, they could uh, lose their uh, lives or uh, get wounded. They still uh, they still uh, do this voluntarily, protecting, defending our motherland. We've talked about elections. We had them in Zaporozhye and Kherson, among others, in Lugansk and the Donetsk Republic. The uh, environment was quite difficult, and the courage of those who actually organized this amazed me. When uh, shelling started, started because our enemies uh, tried to shell them, people go uh, in the basements, and after that they went up and continue. And those uh, stayed in line waiting for their opportunity to vote. Why I'm saying this? Because our heroes, our soldiers who are fighting over there, they do know whom they are defending. This is the key moment. We are defending our people. Soon we will come to an end, but I still have a couple of issues. Uh, on September 1st, uh, a new uh, manual on history uh, was introduced. I will refrain from discussing it. I had an interview with Mr. Medinsky, but there is a certain quote. Life is more complicated than newspaper uh, statements. And our historians will ask themselves, what kind of steps of uh, world leaders, including our uh, leaders, were uh, correct and timely, and in which situations uh, we had to uh, took other decisions? Let's not wait for the history judgment. Uh, what was uh, done right, correct, and what not? Let's wait. Only future generations are capable of. Uh, um, give their evaluation in an objective fashion. Well, uh, Duke uh, Potemkin uh, wrote a letter to Catherine II, uh, and in this letter he wrote about uh, Crimea, uh, when Crimea joined Russia. I, I'm not quoting, but the uh, essence was the following. Time will come. 
and future generation will blame you that you were able to uh, get uh, Crimea joined Russia and you didn't do this and you will be shamed. Uh, national interests come first and uh, this is my most important uh, uh, guiding point and I'm not ashamed because of that. Uh, another question about Olympic Games in France next year. Uh, before before I ask it, uh, let's applaud Danilo Medvedev. Uh, he, he was a finalist and uh, uh, Russian and Serb played uh, two Orthodox men. Let's applaud uh, Daniel. He was capable of doing this. I watched uh, this uh, game. There was no flag. There was no mentioning of Russia. And when uh, the French uh, Olympic Games were mentioned, uh, it was said that there will be no Russian or Belarusian flags over next year. What could you What could you say to our athletes for whom Olympic Games is the uh, most important objective in their athletic lives? Well, I'll say the following. No doubt we have to be guided by the interests of our athletes, first and foremost. And each of them who uh, trade themselves for these important events, they should take their own important decision. But talking about Olympic movement as such, I would say, I would say the following. Well, I believe that present uh, uh, leaders of uh, International Federation or uh, Olympic Committee, they actually undermine uh, uh, the idea, the basic idea of Olympic movement. Olympic movement should consolidate people, not uh, separate them. Olympic movement actually uh, uh, ended up in a trap of financial interests. Well, uh, international athletic, athletic movement was commercialized. And the result is the following. Sponsors, sponsors, uh, leading Western companies who at the end are creating economic and financial basis uh, for uh, international Olympic Committee activities and they are dependent on political structures and governments of their own countries. This chain actually led the uh, Olympic movement and international athletic uh, activities are undermined. Records are not that important. Uh, what is important is for people to get united. And this function is no longer there. It's a pity. This or that, uh, there will be alternative movements appearing. Nobody can do nothing with that. It's an objective thing. Uh, like, for example, our Druzba competition. We will organize uh, competitions uh, as part of BRICS, and uh, it, they won't be pol politicized. And uh, it will kill uh, present international structures. They should be, re uh, they should be renovated. This, that's a pity what is going on. But we will keep defending the interests of our athletes and we will offer them alternative opportunities, in, including on the basis of their financial results and achievement. Uh, uh, well, 55 athletes, in, they changed their Russian citizenship to another citizenship uh, together with Olympic athletes, more than 100. Uh, do you understand these people? I've mentioned this already at the beginning of my answer. People spent uh, dozens and dozens of years to achieve this important uh, uh, result, but uh, due to certain political uh, reasons, they cannot do this. But th there is yet another element here. I don't know whether I can say this, but some claim that 
uh, that uh, sport at an international level is uh, like uh, a reflection of war. Something is true about that. Uh, but an athlete uh, at the highest level, when he earns a medal and he hears uh, he, see, he sees his flag and uh, is, uh, can hear its anthem. It's very important. So my last question. We started saying that our plenary session today, uh, well, 10 years ago, uh, it was claimed that Far East and Siberia for us is a priority. It, same was said today. I'd like to uh, view to to look at our future and to think about Far East and Siberia, how Russia will look like in 10 years' time. Uh, presently, uh, we can see uh, the certain reincarnation on new level comparing to uh, USSR. We used to have pioneer movement. Now we have the movement of the first, and we have the music of our Soviet anth uh, anthem. In our economic achievements uh, uh, fair uh, a fair is being uh, is organized which will reflect what we used to have so the uh, certain um, the certain image of our future is there so what is the type of future image we can choose for Russia you just said that for certain countries the future image had to do with the fact that they used to be members of certain organizations like European Union, etc. Can you do you understand what does it mean of their future image is not only related to their cooperation with somebody, but it is related to, uh, to their um, uh, to, to their certain full dependence from somebody. We don't want this. We don't want this in economic sectors. Uh, and nobody wants peace in Ukraine because if a war stops, then somebody should be held responsible vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people. But now nobody does this. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that after uh, war. The restoration of the Ukrainian economy will start. No, who will who will feed them? Our future depends on our own uh, activities. Uh, recently, I met uh, young scientists, and they asked me. Uh, actually, we discussed this. So, what we have discussed? I change a phrase a little bit, but the idea is there. Uh, scientists are uh, doing their scientific work. Um, industry works in industrial sectors, in agri agriculture, in uh, industrial sectors. Artists, they create images it, which help us to uh, protect our spiritual values. This all together will lead us to a result, no doubt about that. All this should be reflected in uh, the image of our country, including in the security area, should be uh, self-dependent. It doesn't mean that we, we will isolate ourselves from others. It means that together with our partners and uh, our friends, uh, uh, on the basis of integration with the majority of countries which reflect the majority of population uh, on this planet, together with them, we will keep developing our own country uh, and we will make it stronger and stronger. Uh, I've mentioned already that uh, industry, science, etc. But together with that, we should maintain the soul of Russia, our spirit, our multi-ethnic and multi-religious uh, identity, this humanitarian uh, element together with science, education, uh, and real uh, production industry will serve as basis for Russia to advance forward. Understanding ourselves as a sovereign and fully independent state 
uh, with huge perspective for development. And it will happen in spite of all the restrictions and limitations introduced against Russia. What they've expected, that our financial uh, system will coll would collapse, economy would be in ruins, uh, factories will would stop producing, a lot of people would uh, lose their uh, jobs. Nothing of that happened. We are now part of uh, five biggest economies uh, in the world uh, from the point of view of purchasing power, etc. And we have all the opportunities to keep advancing. Yes, our inflation is a little bit higher, but it's still in the framework of certain indices. Our unemployment is 3 percent historical minimum. We've never had this. Well, we have certain other issues related to this uh, in the area of labor resources, but we keep solving them for the first time in for, for the first time uh, in recent years, uh, the real income of our people keep growing. And their, their income is growing and their real salary is growing. Together, these elements will make us believe that Russia not only has solid future, but uh, we will have future which will be based on the efforts of all our multi-ethnic uh, people. At the end, I'd like to say that it looks like an uh, election program, but before December, we cannot claim this. Thank you very much. We uh, spent three hours discussing many, many issues, but it's not possible to embrace what cannot be embraced. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam, Madam, Madam uh, Deputy uh, uh, President. Thank you for coming, and uh, all the best to everybody.